So actually, no one's actually mentioned the word that I, that I can remember anyway, a library. Um, but I think the question, the question uh, is now, <laughs> uh, can we get the library folks up? Uh, is, is really what, and I don't want to put words into their mouths because they'll, they'll, they'll make their own interpretation, but uh, is what is the role of the library? Uh, it's clearly changing in a digital world. And uh, it's changed significantly already, uh, they would say, in their budgets, but uh, also, I think, in, in what, what they do. So I think, it, and I, I, I think a lot of people here will be surprised by what the library is already doing. And then the question is, what, should the, what role should the library play in the future uh, of UCSD? Uh, and David will uh, moderate. Uh, moderate's a bit of a strong word. Um, I will intro and conclude about that. And uh, yeah. Thanks, everyone. And hello. And yes. Uh, so I'm David Miner. I'm director of the Research Data Curation Program at the library. And I'm joined by two colleagues who I'll introduce in just a moment. And as Phil said, we are here actually from the library. We're actually here from multiple units within the library who are working together on a number of programs uh, really geared towards research data and data of all types on campus. Um, so obviously, and Phil kind of alluded to this, uh, the big question is why, why are we here, right? Uh, at first glance, you might think we're mostly, you know, we're not necessarily scientists or researchers, um, although it might surprise you to learn the number of scientists and researchers and domain experts we actually have on staff in the library who work uh, daily uh, in the departments and different domains on campuses um, on different services and solutions. Um, you may not think of us necessarily as a big data organization, um, although again, it might surprise you the number of the amount of data that we house, um, both historically and as we sit here, it's growing literally by the minute uh, stuff is coming into um, the library's repository system. Um, and then finally, uh, following up on that, uh, you may not tend to think of us as kind of big iron, as big infrastructure. Um, but as we'll hear in just a moment, we've got some pretty significant pieces in place uh, geared towards the research enterprise on campus. Uh, so we're going to be touching on all of those um, in the research enterprise. And People tend to think of these things when they think of the library, right? It's stuff. It's books. It's journals. It's a place for the students to sleep. Uh, all those kinds of collections. Um, and that, that's true, but that's, that kind of misses the point. I mean, the point is uh, we're the stewards of the, the intellectual processes of the campus, of the academy, of the university, right? And uh, sure, it's in for thousands of years. It's been housed in, in rocks and then books and then journals and all those kinds of things. Um, but that's changing. And that's changing for us uh, at least as much as, as it's changing for all of you out there. Um, the content that we have coming in now, it's databases, uh, it's data sets, it's oftentimes raw data, it's mixes of raw data and derived data, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're very much tasked with figuring out, okay, what do we do with this stuff? How do we house it? How do we share it? How do we make it available and discoverable for people? How do we preserve it for the long term? Um, and so uh, kind of at that kind of as abstract gross level, that's really what the contemporary library and the contemporary research university is doing. And that's really what we've been focusing on the last few years uh, in a number of initiatives. So uh, I already mentioned I'll do some intros. I already introduced myself. Um, Arwen Hutt here is a metadata librarian who's been looking the last few years at a number of different research collections. And she'll be talking just a second about um, basically is the uh, how do you describe this data? What do you want to say about this data so that, because you know about your data, right? You know a lot about your data. But I'm here to tell you almost nobody else knows about your data, especially outside of your domain. And there's a pretty good chance that in five to 10 years when your current crop of grad students leave, you're going to have trouble figuring out what the heck your data is now, too. Um, we've got suggestions. We can help. We can talk about those kinds of things, at least at, at some useful um, levels there. Uh, sitting next to Arwen is, is Declan Fleming, who's a chief technology strategist and head of IT at the library. And he's going to be talking about uh, that infrastructure we've got in place that we're continuing to put in place uh, to enable a lot of the services and solutions we're putting together. Uh, and then I'll be jumping back in to talk about some other services. So I do want to highlight very briefly, and I'm not going to, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into a lot of depth here. Uh, we're here at the library. We're talking about library stuff. Um, 
But we actually, a lot of what we're talking about day, today is co-driven with another major initiative on campus, the Research Cyber Infrastructure Program, or RCI. Um, RCI has been in place for about three years now, two to three years, um, and is a uh, brought to the campus by a number of the institutions um, that you heard at the beginning to provide infrastructure services, um, a whole stack and suite of things. And uh, I won't be going into that, but one of the main uh, aspects in there is actually data curation. And so a lot of what we're doing is working hand in hand with RCI, the library and RCI, to determine what are the best collection of services, what kind of data do we want to work with, how do we want to solve some of these problems, et cetera, et cetera. So um, could easily do a whole other presentation just on, on the RCI and what the RCI is doing. So what are we talking about here? I've used the word curation a couple times, data. Um, at, at the most kind of highest operational level, uh, we tend to approach it as a life cycle, right? The data is a life cycle. And this should not be controversial or surprising. Um, data gets created, whether it's through simulations, observations, computations, anything like that. Um, it gets stored. It gets stored for usage right now, for access right now, so that people can get to it. Uh, and then it gets analyzed, uh, whatever analy an, uh, analysis happens to mean for that particular data set. It gets published. Uh, used to mean published meant in a journal, in a specific set of journals. Um, that's changing by the minute also in what publish means. Um, then it gets preserved for the long term. And this is the preservation aspect is becoming more and more important as funder requirements are kicking in for some of these things. And then finally, a lot of that gets fed back into the creation cycle. Like I said, in of itself, this isn't particularly interesting. Oop. But we're really using this to approach um, how we target some of the tools and services and things that we're putting together. And so we're really trying to say, what are the different parts of this workflow and how can we kind of bring ourselves to bear in the most useful ways, whether it's um, tools and services and the data curation, uh, managed accessible storage, again, whatever that happens to mean. Um, we're going to talk about metadata. That means I can talk forever. <laughs> he dropped the timing slides. Um, <laughs> I won't, don't worry. Um, uh, metadata for sharing and best practices, uh, whether it's domain-driven, campus-driven, UC-driven. We forget about UC an awful lot. We can't um, in a lot of these processes. Um, object identifiers for contemporary publishing, online publishing, and digital distribution, and then archives for the long term. So today we're going to talk about, uh, initially, uh, the first kind of uh, almost a half dozen services here. Arwen is going to jump in and talk about metadata. Uh, Declan will jump in and talk about asset management. Uh, then you'll get me a little bit to talk about some other services um, and with a quick wrap up. Uh, and then we're going to leave time for any questions or comments. Um, and we're also right before the break, so we'll figure out where that goes. So. Hi. Uh, as David said, my name is Arwen Hutt, and I'm a metadata specialist at the library. I'm going to talk to you very briefly um, about the work we've been doing with research data. We've been tackling the issue of data curation for a little while now, uh, combining our existing knowledge base, our experience with traditional library materials, and most interestingly, our, our work over the last couple of years with a handful of researchers on campus. Um, an important part of... Let's see if I... An important part of this work has been a process for us of determining what um, is an object in the context of the research data we're working with. This involves looking at different aspects of the data itself, its knowledge universe, as well as the researchers' expectations for the data. Some of the questions we ask trying to determine this include what actually constitutes a discrete set of data, where are the boundaries on it, um, so, for example, with the, the presentation we heard earlier with the uh, data coming in from the electrical grids, is it the entire raw set of data or is it the sample that actually is surrounding that specific event? Um, what's required, be that files or metadata, for the data to be understandable, usable, and reusable now? In addition, what's necessary for the data to be usable in the future? what's important for long-term preservation and um, functionality of the data. Also, what should be displayed and shared? What parts of the data are important for displaying in a repository and making available to other users? And paired with this, what is important to be able to reference? Uh, where should digital object identifiers be assigned to allow the appropriate parts of the object to be cited or the data to be cited and thus give the original researchers full acknowledgement of their work? 
So these questions give you a little brief idea of how we go about exploring the boundaries of the data we've been working with. Uh, the process in itself involved a lot of discussion, in-depth needs assessment, um, both of the data and of the researchers' um, expectations for the data curation process. Um, it, was, it was a very interesting process and very enlightening for us. Um, another area of, of our work has been providing some basic assist, some assistance with thinking about some general data management principles. Uh, we do like to organize things at the library, so this is something that we like, but um, and how this can help with uh, organizing those materials and data. So including just briefly some things like collocation, pulling together files, data, and metadata that could be stored in different places, um, or if there's a need for distributed storage, making sure that's organized in an intentional and uh, um, logical way. Um, also thinking about identifiers, developing naming protocols for metadata and, med metadata and files if it doesn't already exist. And identifiers don't necessarily need to be semantically rich, but it's important, of course, that they're unique within their context. Um, and they also can be a really simple mechanism for linking files and metadata together or expressing relationships between different files. Um, also, just general data cleanup issues like dealing with duplicates and versioning, that sort of thing. And of course, there's the metadata itself. I'm a bit biased, of course, being a metadata specialist, but I think it's vitally important. Um, it enables functionality of our data and of the systems that use the data. Uh, some of the, the main functions that uh, I'm going to talk about that are especially important in the context of, of big, complex uh, research data uh, include things like preservation. Uh, again, can it be maintained in a viable, usable state over time? Uh, discoverability, assuming the data is being shared, uh, can it be found by other researchers or users? It's also important that it be understandable. Um, can it be uh, interpreted and understood by other researchers? This is clearly a bigger challenge for data which isn't self-describing. So the more abstract the data is, the more important it is to have good supporting metadata, for example, descriptions of the data collection conditions, uh, identification of variables in the data set, that sort of thing. Um, also, is it usable? So this is similar to understandable, but a little bit different. Can the data be reused by other researchers? So for example, can they identify and access any necessary programs or scripts for processing or uh, rendering the data? And finally, tracking. Can you tell who has cited your data and where it's been? So these functions are important for a host of reasons, but as David alluded to, they're especially important in the context of new funder mandates um, for how research data is handled. So we've been working on figuring out how to best meet these needs. Uh, this can be through the creation of metadata to facilitate these areas of functionality, um, identifying and using appropriate controlled vocabularies or value lists, formatting issues, formatting around metadata, uh, thinking about work, metadata workflow and creation, all of that sort of thing. Um, and then when it all comes together, ideally, we, um, so when it comes together, the, this decision about what an object is, um, the data cleanup, the metadata creation, at the end, our goal is to have something that can be preserved, shared, and used, that no matter how complex the original data is presented in such a way that it can be understood. And that brings us to the technology, which is a vital part of doing this. Hey there. So we have a technology stack. Oh, there it is. Um, it was funny. It might surprise you to know that we do a lot of software development in the library. I have an excellent uh, software development team there, small but, but excellent. And this is our technology stack for storing the objects. Um, we have do this properly. We have a preservation layer on the bottom. Um, David will talk more about Chronopolis in just a minute. If you think about what we're trying to do here is store digital objects that live, we want to store them forever, but they live on hardware that lives for about five years if you're lucky, three years normally with uh, dropping laptops and things like that. So we'll talk about Chronopolis and the preservation efforts there. Um, we have a storage layer here that's actually um, distinct from the rest of the, of the software we actually write. So we stick with POSIX level and cloud, some cloud storage that lets um, what we store, the, the unique things that we store, live beyond our software. We know at some point 
this whole layer could go away, at least archaeologically, someone should be able to come across our storage and be able to pull things out and get some meaning out of them. I'll talk more about how we do that a little bit better in a minute. Um, we support both local storage uh, and cloud storage, work with the SDSC cloud with that at the moment. Um, the dams repository is the software we've been working on for 10 years, actually. We've, we've started this quite a while ago, working on an RDF-based and triple store-based metadata store. We went with RDF, and I'll show you a slide of that in just a minute, because there are standards in the library world, um, and they're not the same. They, they, they change their minds a lot. Um, a lot of things um, are added and deleted and changed on a regular basis, and the kinds of objects that we get every year are getting a little bit more complex, a little more interesting, and especially as we get into the, the research data, um, we're finding there's, there's ways that, and branches and things we can go down that we can't predict beforehand. RDF is a way of, of it's a meta language about metadata that lets you talk at a baser level and break things up into little pieces so you can show more things. I'll show you a little bit more of that in just a second. Um, this is, the, we have a DAMS API layer right here, which lets us talk to our DAMS manager, which is a, a Java front end for being batch ingest and, and doing lots of uh, metadata messing. And then we're working with, um, one of the weaknesses of having, doing your own software and being kind of uh, trying to be special is that you end up with uh, something you've got to carry all by yourself. So we're starting to work with the community more, the digital library community, on a project called Hydra, which is a Ruby on Rails front end for doing digital library things. Normally it goes on a back end called Fedora. People may have heard that. It's not the Red Hat Fedora. It's, it's another Fedora project that's been out there for a lot of years, about the same length of time as the dams. And we're working more and more closely with them, uh, the Fedora project and the Hydra project, so this has more sustainability over time. There'll be more developers and people involved in it over time. Um, Solar is our index. I don't know if you've heard of that before, but it's based on Lucene. It's just a way of putting a bunch of stuff in and getting it back out again very quickly in, in a search methodology. This is probably looking familiar to you if you were talking about the damn stuff just earlier on. And then we have a, uh, a streaming server actually here. This is, I give this talk fairly often about the technology things. So it's, it's uh, streaming servers are weird. They don't like dealing with the web and, and talking to your objects like you want them to. They want, they want access directly to the storage here. So we had to do some funky stuff with that to make that work properly. Are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> This is an RDF tree, and this basically says that we can handle just about any kind of data that comes at us um, because we break it up into very, very small parts and we hook things together. You won't be able to read this, but just in general, you can kind of see the root is over here, and that's identified by a unique identifier. We use a system called ARCS, A-R-K. It's a, a, a namespace in the world that's, that's, that we can generate unique identifiers in. And then we can hang all kinds of values and sets of values and nested values off of that so we can actually do interesting things with with uh, interesting data. Um, we have an ontology for the dams that says how we should do things so we can start a conversation with both the special collections people and also the research data people about how to get started with this. But then Arwen's group goes way into depth on that, on, on getting exactly how things should fit in here and whether we should extend it or not. It's extensible as well too, so we can add the things if we need to. This is uh, DAMS 4, the newest in, in incarnation of it. It's actually in beta at the moment. Um, we plan on going into production at first, the beginning of next year. With that, DAMS 3 is already, if you go to library's website and look at the digital collections, you'll see there's one there already. We've had that going for a number of years. This is the new one. This is that new look and feel I was talking about that comes with Hydra front end. It's a, a bootstrap-based interface and some nice uh, uh, prettiness we get with you know sorting things and looking nice, lists of things. Um, there's faceting over here on the right. This is what the solar gets us. So when you look up something, you can kind of look off and see what's like this and how does it connect to other things. Um, and I'm using the same slide that Arwen did just to show this, all that work and all that complexity gets, gets to boil down to something simple like this that, that can be used by a user. People can take a look at. So you can see these. There are parts of parts of parts that you can actually get down to and view on the screen and get the information about them and download them and do things with them. We're also working very closely with um, the metadata folks to create a schema.org mapping for the metadata so that Google can pick this stuff up in, a, in an easy way, the other, the other search engines as well. I think that was my last slide. Uh, me again. Um, so Declan already mentioned this. Uh, I do want to highlight, though, um, what he was really talking about, uh, obviously, is for discovery, contemporary data, you need to get it, you want to find out about it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, underlying that is long-term preservation. Um, 
Chronopolis has been in place for almost a decade now. Uh, it is actually run by UCSD, it's a UCSD service, um, but we manage data coming in and we actually uh, actively replicate it and manage it outside of California. Um, so it's outside of our fault zones that we saw so that when we <laughs> blow up, it's not, the, the data is still there, even though we may not be. Um, and uh, and uh, we, it's, it's a very advanced digital preservation system. Um, we are also one of the founding members of something called the Digital Preservation Network, which is at the moment one of the world's largest preservation networks that's just spinning up. So any data that comes into Chronopolis actually will be um, highly, highly replicated um, and preserved. And uh, we're really gearing this towards um, being able to be folded into a lot of the funder mandates that are coming out that your data needs to live beyond your three-year or five-year grant or however many years your grant is for. Uh, what's the solution for that? How do you begin to at least approach that at the first level? Something else we've mentioned a couple times in different scenarios, and this is actually very, very important and something people aren't necessarily aware of quite so much yet, is object identifiers. And this is really getting at the notion that your data is somewhere. You want to cite it. You want to be able to basically footnote your data. You want to be able to point people to your data. You want it to be able to live somewhere that is um, standard, standardized, and referenceable in a standard way, if, if that's correct. Um, and so uh, actually on this campus as UCSD people, you have access for free to an international organization called DataCite. And DataCite is an um, international body that is a standards body that provides object identifiers. Um, and if you were to go and, and subscribe yourself, it's thousands of dollars. Uh, but the library pays for this for everybody on UCSD campus. Um, all you need to do is contact us, and we will set up an account for you. And then you can actually go and using a service called EasyID, which is a web-based front end, mint your own object identifiers so that you can point people to them. They also have APIs so that you can embed them into your own computational workflows. Um, and this is really getting by, uh, getting to not just pointing to what you have today, but the, the contemporary notion of what a publication is, right? Getting beyond just it's a journal in the journal of whatever your field is, um, but something online, whether it's um, an online journal, whether it's a blog, whether it's a more active kind of wiki space, you can still drill down into your objects and have them be in a stable environment that you can cite and point people to. So this is a very important service. Uh, last thing I want to mention is uh, another service that's been around for a few years. It's the data management plan tool. Uh, and not surprisingly, this has come up out of all the different funder requirements. Um, this is a national tool. Actually, I think it's starting, it's um, maybe looking at some international options also. Um, but UCSD has been one of the major participants in this tool. And, and this is an online uh, resource where you can go. And you can do a couple things. But the two primary ones is, one is you can actually use it to generate data management plans. Um, and. Uh, doesn't, you can't really see, it says funder requirements on there. Um, all of the different funding agencies are represented here. All of the different um, directorates in NSF, NIH, NEH, the Sloan Foundation, Gordon Betty Moore Foundation, a bunch of ones I'm not thinking of right now. Um, you go in here and you actually drill down into the specific requirements of that funder. And so you can create something that specifically targets what you are required to put into your proposal. You can use this tool to actually write them and spit them out, or you can just go to the tool to see what those requirements are. Because sometimes they make it really difficult to know what they are, even though they're going to re potentially reject your proposal for not meeting them. Um, so this is something we have in place. We've worked hard with Sharon Franks and uh, at ORA to, to look at some of these things over the year. We've got examples on our website of, of other tools, of other um, plans, I should say. And in the spring, we're going to start up a series of classes. We've done this in the past on how to meet some of these requirements and how to work through some of these issues. Um, but I want to drill back actually now to something that uh, Phil said in his introduction, which is, so we're putting things in place. The libraries here, we don't exist for our own benefit. We don't really exist for our benefit. We exist for your benefit. And we're really a place where we're trying to put things in together that are not targeted towards this domain or that lab or that researcher, but it's across those. Um, the whole point of the dams and the whole point of the metadata wasn't so that necessarily you can go and find your stuff, but so that other people can go and find your stuff. And people who want to know about oceanography and brain researchers and archaeologists have a common place where, a common space where all that stuff is. And so we need to base what we're doing on, on you, right? On your content and your data and your guidance. Um, 
So what we've tried to do today is really just kind of give you a, a little flash of what we're working on, but we'd really like to have this be the start of a dialogue, um, the start of a, uh, as much a campus-wide dialogue as we can, not just for content, but for policies, for procedures. Uh, Phil said, what could you use that's not money? We can all use money, but we can also use policies and procedures about what do we do with data? Who owns the data? How do we share data? There's mandates coming through, not just from the funders, but from UC in terms of how data can be, needs to be shared and requirements and things like that. So we're very much interested in operating that space and working with people in that. So, uh, whoop. Um, uh, so this is our contact information. We're around all day. Uh, we're in you know, our building. We have a big building on campus. Um, so uh, come and talk to us anytime you want. And so we did leave time. We're happy to take questions. We can do it as a discussion or questions or whatever's useful. So. I'd like somehow to make that available to researchers. Um, it is medical, I guess, but I'm making it available. Um, have you had anything like that? I mean, is that, if you have a data type that say a spreadsheet that you had metadata to, is that something you guys could put up? Yeah. Yes, um, uh, with the pilot projects that we've done with the researchers, we do have a number of forms of data that it, it's right now a lot of the specialized data forms and the data, sorry, <laughs> the, the data things, so not images, not audio, not video, is a download. Um, so it's not, we're not rendering it within the, the dams, but it is available for a download. We haven't dealt with medical um, information yet, but I but I presume if it's yours, you're allowed to you know give us a license that says. Yeah, the word a, presume is a little bit. Uh, yeah, little yeah, worse. I wouldn't. I think we actually have a, a legal counsel who would have to make that thing. Um, Pretty that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you want somebody at the point of the spear? Let's talk. <laughs> And if, and if I, I do want to uh, highlight also what Arwen said, too, that it, not surprisingly, probably a significant amount of the data that we're going to be seeing is spreadsheet and tabular-based data. I mean, that's how data is collected in many cases. So, yeah, absolutely, it's what we look for. Hi. Uh, I tried to put together a grant. Uh, I needed support from a librarian. Uh, I, the answer that I got is that um, we, it's hard to put... Uh, this, uh, the time that the librarian can commit it to the project because you have uh, the regular affair that you need to deal with. So how we can, because the, the funding agency would like to see some commitment from our collaborating librarians, so how that can be arranged. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and uh, yes, and I'm not sure exactly when you asked that question, but that's something that is in uh, evolution right now. That I think it's certainly the case that today and going forward, uh, we've had extensive discussions within the library about letting time be put onto grants, especially if it can be clearly defined what the function is, right? I mean, that's, that's not surprising. That's not been something the library has done very much of over the years. Uh, but certainly going forward, it's going to be a part of, of how we approach a lot of these solutions. 